My name is Frank Musica, and I am one of Victor's risk management consultants. Today, I will show information with you about documentation. Um, we named this program after an old George Strait song in which he tried to make up for the bad communications he had with some late documentation. We want this to be a reminder for you uh, before you have a breakup with your client. Uh, I thank you for uh, joining me today for this webinar, during which I want to remind you both of the need to communicate with your client throughout a project and of the critical importance of proper documentation of client discussions, contractor performance, and your carrying out of your contractual, professional, and ethical duties when designing the capital asset. These reminders will also apply to a certain extent to those other services you provide that do not result in the construction of a facility. On every project, it is important for you to clearly communicate what you will do and what you accomplish for the client and to document the design and construction of the project according to your contractual obligations. So we are going to look at four basic concerns. Here they are. We will examine the process that leads to a contractual obliga obligation addressing what you will do for your client and at times what you will definitely not do. We will look at documenting your performance throughout the project so that you can prove that you have met contract, uh, contractual requirements as well as your regulatory and ethical obligations and that you performed your services in a reasonable manner. Uh, we will discuss the importance of having a system to record the communications that happen during the project and your fulfillment of your contractual obligations. And we will talk about why it is vital for a firm to close out a project by purging unnecessary documentation and preserving what is critical in protecting your firm from future claims. First, let's talk about client communications and contract negotiations. Good firms have the ability to work with clients, guide their understanding, and shape their expectations about the services and the project. But many firms still do not educate their clients as to the firm's professional duties and responsibilities. Now, your marketing much must generate a reaction to win a project, but it also must avoid potential problems created by how a firm communicates its skills and experiences. When a project is negotiated, it is critical to make sure that the client understands that the final written contract, what is often referred to by lawyers as the four corners of the contract, document the services to be provided and that marketing hype or misstatements are not contractual obligations. Much of what is said during marketing is looked at by the law as mere puffery, saying that you are the best firm or care about the client's bottom line, for example. But when marketing material, and we see this on um, firm websites quite a bit, states that a firm's projects come out on time and on budget, that firm can find itself in big trouble because the statements can create a detrimental reliance situation and even constitute a warranty obligation. I think too often design professionals think that the standard of care determination will protect them in all situations. But very few claims ever get to the stage of litigation where the standard of care is examined and applied. So it is vital for firms to discuss with their clients what the expectations for services should be and critical that they do not allow professional service agreements to modify the standard of care in a way that's unreasonable or in a way that could constitute a contractually assumed obligation that exceeds a firm's normal liability in the performance of professional services. Uh, while a contract does not have to establish a standard of care, the standard of care exists even if it's never mentioned in a contract, it is critical to communicate with the client that the design firm's efforts to assist the client in putting a capital asset in place has to fall within the scope of reasonableness and is not a guarantee of performance of services or success of the project. Of course, that discussion or explanation is not helpful if the client then sticks a contractually assigned responsibility 
that exceeds the reasonableness of, of the standard of care into the contract. I always suggest that the contract establish the informed consent of the client to specific goals and limitations on design services. This is especially true when design firms will increasingly face second guessing on issues such as whether a project was designed appropriately uh, in a time of challenging climate variability. Documenting the contract negotiation properly means that the contract should contain an integration clause that provides that the writing, the contract, contains the entire agreement between the parties and the contract supersedes all prior oral and written agreements. And a good contract should require that no waiver or modification of its terms is valid unless it is contained in the writing signed by the firm. That insulates the firm from altering its legal obligations by oral statements and reduces the likelihood that emails or other communications are binding. Uh, it is critical that those performing the design and construction phase services understand the limitations on communications and that they avoid documenting performance that is less than expected. You know, a high stakes lawsuit can often be swayed by a single document, a recorded statement or an email, and the document does not need to be an outright admission of wrongdoing. It may simply contain a statement from someone for instance, on site to which the client can later claim detrimental reliance. Or it may be an expression of a private thought between colleagues at the firm. And if nothing else, sloppy communications during construction um, can really damage a firm's reputation. I should talk about photography as inappropriate documentation. Um, not too long ago, we had an example where a landscape architect um, was hit for policy limits on a professional liability claim. Uh, the landscape architecture firm had a young landscape architect on the site, uh, supposedly reviewing the work of the contractor, building a, a massive retaining uh, a privacy wall around a, a complex. Um, the young landscape architect was out there and took a lot of photography, and took a lot of uh, pictures of the wall being constructed. And it was being constructed improperly. All those pictures ended up in the file. And when that full that wall started to fall apart in a few years, and the client brought claims against everyone involved, in that project file was evidence that the young landscape architect saw something that was improperly constructed and did nothing about it. So you have to be cautious about photo documentation and especially about photo documentation provided by others. Clients or contractors at times record site developments through drones or on-site cameras. Too often that information is provided to the design firm and the design firm places it in the project file without consideration of the risks of doing so. If a firm has no obligation to review the material, it should affirmatively reject the recordings. No firm should keep information it does not need to carry out its contractual obligations. And a firm's evaluation documentation is often corrupted by inappropriate photography because of the ease of using the camera. If the evaluation includes examining the detail, it's of course appropriate to, to take a picture of that detail. The evaluation also of what's going on on the site could also include photography from a distance. But photography that is randomly taken and stored in the project file can later show problems that were not examined during the time of, of the evaluation and were not subject to the site visit. Um, I think firms realize that during the performance construction phase services, appropriate documentation is critical. Most firms have standard construction contract administration procedures and forms but documenting that those procedures were followed is often lacking. Shop drawing and submittals review must be properly documented, especially if the firm has to return unrequested information with the not requested or not required uh, for review stamps. In site visits for observations or evaluations or inspections at the appropriate times, 
should result in a report in a standard format and again, beware of photography. And do not be apprehensive about qualifying the visits such as by stating only this was observed for evaluation as required by the contract. Other work was not observed or evaluated. And if the site cannot be visited, you know, if we're back into a pandemic situation, special disclaimers are needed to document the limitation of the services. Uh, change management is important. So when an issue is identified and contractual changes made for additional services or additional time for the construction, the process set out in the contract has to be followed and appropriately documented. For design services, that usually means an executed standard form or an acknowledgement letter from the authorized representative of the client, right? Not just a verbal communications by someone who says they're representing the client. And pay applications um, must be documented as carefully um, as possible by requiring, you know, and as they are required by the contract, uh, and not simply treated as a you know, we always do it this way, methodology. So, uh, the first bullet point here states exactly what documentation must be. Records related to what you have done to meet your contractual obligations must be made in a logical way cannot be after the fact recollections, they must be contemporaneously made, and must always be objective. But there are new challenges to the systematic recording of performance. Uh, while we are seeing more firms forcing people back into a centralized office, there are some that have really adopted the remote working environment, and that could cause problems. In some situations, firms do that because they can tap uh, talent at reduced costs. In fact, I was out visiting a firm in a smaller city that for decades had recruited engineers from larger firms in larger cities by showing them the cost advantages of living in a small city, cheaper housing, cheaper taxes, uh, usually a, a lifestyle younger engineers with families wanted. But now that firm has seen its top talent being poached by firms in large cities. And these larger firms have found that they can have at least some of their staff working remotely because they have honed the skills of managing a decentralized workforce. So they offer more money, allow the engineers to stay where they are and reduce salary costs company-wide by doing so. But this can create internal communications problems and more importantly, documentation issues. Uh, during a centralized uh, decentralization of staffing, some firms routinely recorded team meetings by team or, or Zoom calls or whatever. And the recordings often contain discussions that should never be made public. But the recordings of discussions are discoverable and often can, they can be disastrous. So if you're working remotely, if your firm has that kind of, of uh, system set up and you're recording and not purging the recording in a timely manner, uh, those recordings could establish a record that could be held against your firm. And let's talk about emails. Well, on one hand, emails are necessary and, and a useful form of documentation. They are both retrievable and discoverable. Remember that uh, with emails, they never disappear. There is a tremendous industry out there called forensic email analysis. When a dispute happens, your emails are discoverable, and since they are never properly organized, email forensic tools are used to search your hard drives, both to turn up relevant evidence and often as a phishing expedition to discover other possible causes of action against you. And this is not limited to your office records. If you are sloppy enough to keep extra information on a personal computer, even a home computer, that will be searched. Remember, during the entire process, your goal should be to clarify your services and confirm your performance. Part of this is to show your client that you're meeting the expectations set forth in your contract. And part of this is to develop a record that could be important in future claims against your firm. So with emails, always remember that emails are a permanent record and treat them appropriately. Don't be casual, don't be accusatory, don't admit to something, 
and be careful and consistent with subject lines so that the email can be properly retained. And as more information is being shared through cell phones and messaging apps, documentation is becoming even more challenging. Most firms retain emails, and, and perhaps some emails that never should be retained, but few firms adequately document telephone conversations or texts. Cell phone calls and texts are the most challenging. Uh, they need to be carefully worded uh, to document facts, determine decisions made, or appropriately qualified professional opinions specific to the project. And firms need to be extremely wary of texting or instant messaging or other systems that by their very nature are extremely casual and can easily create confusion or be taken out of context. There really is a continu uh, continuum of risk uh, for these types of communication, and they demand proper pr uh, preparation and documentation. You know, one of the disappointments to those of, of us who for decades have been advising firms on communications and documentation is that the same firms that used to log telephone calls and carefully uh, prepare correspondence are now sloppy. Remember, if you don't record a call such as a cell phone call, the record of that call, that that call was made, remains, and then chances are great that the other party did document the conversation. And we've had many situations where contractors have purposely used a cell phone call to an engineer or an architect to try to get information and then documented that call to prove that it was a fault that a problem was the fault of the architect or engineer and not of the contractor. Now, I've seen many project files that I wish had been destroyed as soon as the project was finished uh, because some firms treat documentation as a costly and painful process. Project files often serve as a dumping ground for information that never should be kept. Often it is poorly worded communication or photographic evidence. Um, some legal counsel working with firms have determined that since project records are often self-incriminatory, uh, since somewhere in a the record there may be evidence of bad judgment, that these firms should destroy records as soon as possible. Others have found that firms do not purge records properly and often have official and unofficial or duplicative records that can lead to problems. So many legal counsel advise quick disposal of records. Uh, and this is another case where I can go back to guidance we offered to firms in the CNA program 50 years ago, before my time. Uh, in fact, we republished a documentation and document uh, retention article from 1972 uh, in 2017 because everything in that article was still relevant. It suggests that purging files immediately after the project is completed and having a set record retention policy for the firm that keeps the pared down information for the period of the statute of repose plus one or two years, uh, because many of those statutes of repose have a claim extension period of about that time. Of course, there are no hard and fast rules about how long to keep project files from other records, employee records, contracts, building information often have to meet specific standards. But we have always suggested that a good set of project records be kept and using the applicable statute of repose and having a policy based on purging records right after the project ends and destroying records a few years after the statute of repose period is prudent. Uh, as you probably know, statutes of repose differ from statutes of limitations in terms of the point of time from which the limitation is measured. Statutes of limitations begin at the date of injury or the discovery of a deficiency. Since the discovery of an injury or a deficiency could occur at any time, the exposure to a claim could theoretically run indefinitely. So statutes of repose, on the other, other hand, begin at a period of time, such as following the completion of services or the substantial completion of construction. So these statutes, limit the total period of time which the design professional is exposed to liability and thus statutes of repose are favorable to statutes of limitations. But statutes of repose do not apply to all the services provided by professional service firms. 
because they originally created to provide a benefit to construction contractors, they usually only apply to professional services when those services lead to actual construction. In addition, some statutes of repose never cut off the right of a public entity to bring a claim. And in most states, a client can negotiate either an extension of the statutory period, you know, by tying the right to bring a claim to, for instance, the discovery of harm, or eliminate um, it totally. So that while third parties might be restricted from bringing a claim, the client has a right going forward. And remember that the statute of repose in your state of practice or even in the state where the project was built might not be the statute that applies. So look at the choice of law provisions in your contract to determine what statute might apply and use that as part of your record keeping. Uh, firms also need to keep in mind that they might have a contractual obligation to retain project directors. Uh, if there are no unusual contractual obligations, a firm should have a system to purge records of extraneous material when the project is complete and a system to evaluate the longevity of records once the statute of repose runs. Uh, and some states still do not have an effective cutoff of exposure, so a firm has to be careful. Um, but in any case, once a firm has set a records retention policy, it has to follow that policy. Record retention policies are actually record destruction policies. So a firm should never assume that it can be casual about enforcing its policy. And of course, there is the issue of spoliation of evidence. So destroying records once a claim is filed can lead to serious consequences for a firm. When any dispute arises, lawyers put a what's called a legal hold on any information that can be related to the dispute so that nothing then can be destroyed. Okay, so here are some basic reminders. Um, start out by asking your client what special design considerations might exist and document the client's responses. The client might have some special concerns about sustainability or security, and those should be recorded. The climate change creating risks for projects that are not currently addressed by codes and standards, um, which are of course usually based on outdated historic information, having that informed consent acknowledgement by your client is valuable. Um, and stating what codes in your professional opinion will guide the design project is also useful in documentation. Um, know your contractual and professional obligations, especially those during the construction phase, and record your performance of those obligations in a way that is systematic, contemporaneous, and objective, right? Keep that in mind, systematic, contemporaneous, and objective and get rid of the junk and keep the meaningful information according to your records retention and destruction policy. Uh, these business processes uh, should really help keep your firm in business. And uh, with that, you know, I'm going to end the program and go on to um, a bit about uh, some resources we have.